This video demonstrates an infraclavicular approach for the surgical and endovascular management of Paget Schroeder syndrome. The patient is a 46 year old male who presented with a three day history of progressive left upper extremity swelling and pain. He did not have a history of recent trauma or intravenous catheters in the extremity or neck. He was not on routine medications and had no family history of thrombophilia. Venous duplex revealed extensive thrombus in the left internal jugular vein, subclavian and axillary veins. Paget Schroeder syndrome was suspected and he underwent catheter directed thrombolysis. Paget Schroeder syndrome is a form of thoracic outlet obstruction, which accounts for about 2% of all episodes of venous thrombosis. It typically occurs in relatively young individuals who participate in competitive athletics or physically demanding occupations involving the upper extremities. The mechanism is compression of the subclavian vein as it courses through the anterior thoracic outlet at the junction of the first rib and clavicle. Repetitive shoulder motion causes shearing injury of the vein. This produces intimal damage which results in a thrombogenic surface that increases the risk of DVT. This is a venogram that was done at the time of catheter-directed thrombolysis, which shows thrombosis of the axillary vein that extends up into the subclavian and internal jugular veins. This is the patient's venogram following catheter-directed thrombolysis. As you can see, there is a significant stenosis in the proximal subclavian vein. These diagrams show the anatomy of the thoracic outlet and the anatomic relationship of the subclavian vein to the first rib, clavicle, subclavius muscle, and anterior scalene muscle. The infraclavicular incision is shown. It begins at the costoclavicular head, extending laterally. The clavicular head of the pectoralis muscle is divided, exposing the distal subclavian vein. This is the distal subclavian vein. And it is looped with a vessel loop. Dissection is carried out to expose the subclavius muscle. The subclavius muscle tendon is exposed. and incise with electrocautery. The subclavian vein is again looped slightly proximally. And retracted laterally for further proximal exposure. A retractor is used to retract the vein anteriorly underneath the clavicle, providing exposure of the underlying first rib. The first rib is scored with the electrocautery. Again, the subclavian vein is being retracted. The rib excision is begun by incising the periosteum with electrocautery and then using the rangeur to excise the bone. I try not to get around the rib and risk injury to the underlying pleura. 
The edge of the rib is grasped with a coker. And the rib cutter is used to further excise the rib. As you can see, the underlying pleura is shown. I feel to make sure there are no sharp edges on the resected rib. The subclavian vein is then returned to its normal position. Next, through the same incision, the distal subclavian vein is cannulated with a 6 French vascular sheath over a guide wire. A venogram is obtained as shown. As you can see, there is still residual stenosis in the vein even after thoracic outlet decompression. This is consistent with the pathophysiology of this disorder. Next, an angioplasty balloon is deployed across the stenotic segment. We started off the angioplasty using a 7 mm balloon and dilated up to 9 mm. Following angioplasty, a completion venogram shows a very satisfactory result. This shows his pre op and post op venograms. A post-op chest x-ray is routinely done to rule out pneumothorax. The patient was discharged the following day and given a month of oral anticoagulation. Two months later, he is back to work and has had no symptoms in that extremity. In summary, Paget Schroeder syndrome should be suspected in any young active patient who presents with an upper extremity DVT. The treatment is early thrombolysis followed by surgical decompression of the thoracic outlet. Any significant residual stenosis should be addressed at the time of surgery to reduce the risk of rethrombosis. The infraclavicular approach allows for surgical decompression and endovascular intervention to be performed through the same incision expeditiously and effectively.